Okay, well, let's get going. We have a wonderful, all kinds of fantastic ideas and themes to cover, and I'm just going to give an introduction to lead us a prelude, so to speak, up to the world of the Kabbalistic masters of the, <coughs> of the 1500s. So by way of introduction, let me say that, first of all, mysticism always takes place within a particular prescribed religious tradition. Many books have been written about mysticism. One of the most famous is uh, Evelyn Underhill, who wrote a fantastic survey of mystical movements. Uh, I think it's, the book is over 100 years old now. It's kind of a classic. But there's no such thing as general mysticism. Okay, mysticism in and of itself always partakes of a particular prescribed religious tradition. So there's Sufi mysticism, Jewish mysticism, Christian, and so forth and so on. And in each, in each of those mystical movements have perhaps some threads in common, some themes and ideas and uh, opportunities that are shared. But on the other hand, each particular mystical movement is in and of itself special or different because it is embedded within that particular religious tradition. So I think that's, so therefore I want to say that not, <clears throat> not all of these great thinkers and people that uh, Petter is going to sh talk about in the, in the coming weeks, uh, <clears throat> they're all living in the world of Jewish mysticism, but there's so many varieties, there's so many uh, shades of Jewish mysticism, so to speak. So many different nuances and aspects to Jewish mysticism. The word Kabbalah and the whole idea of Kabbalistic interpretation doesn't really arrive until about this time, in the 1200s. So I need to start a little bit earlier to give you the, the quick survey of where we came from. Right? So <clears throat> the rabbis over 2,000 years ago said that we can't read any biblical text uh, <clears throat> in a simple manner. I think Mark Twain once wrote something like, if God intended us to read the Bible straight off the page the way it's translated today, probably he or she could have written a much better book. <laughs> but we know <laughs> that to read Jewish texts, to read biblical texts, is to delve into many layers or many levels of interpretation. So I want to give you the classic explanation of how we, how <clears throat> the rabbis, meaning the sages of the first, second, third, fourth centuries, delved into any particular verse or story in the Bible. They used the word pardes, which is a kind of a classic uh, Hebrew-Persian loan word. It means the orchard. And they take the four uh, consonants from Pardes and, and use each consonant as a, as a level of understanding, as a level of interpretation. The first level when you're reading a story, for example, we're reading J uh, Jacob and <clears throat> put his head on the rock and lay down at Beersheba and dreamed a dream and saw angels ascending and descending from heaven. So that's the straightforward uh, modern English translation. And <clears throat> that's called Peshat. But it's, it's not simply to read the story and say, OK, what does this mean in English? Or what does it mean in Spanish? It is to understand the context of the story as it's been translated. And the context involves looking at the vocabulary, looking at the grammar particularly. And especially since Hebrew is such a concise language, you have to look at every single verb and determine what are the various meanings or different levels of meaning of a, of a verb, because most verbs in Hebrew have four or five, sometimes even more, uh, basic meanings, depending on whether it's an active verb, an intensive verb, a passive verb, uh, a reflexive verb. So Peshat literally means straightforward in Hebrew. It means more than just the straight meaning. It means, as I said, the grammar, the vocabulary. Then the second level of delving into a text 
is called remas from the R. Remas means hints. hints. Uh, which means that we have to start to look at the story and compare it to other stories in the Bible. Are there stories in the Bible that also refer to angels, also refer to divine uh, beings coming down from heaven, so to speak, and interfacing with a human being? So that's, that's part of what happens in this level called remas. It's an, I put down, it's an allegorical way of understanding the story. Uh, <clears throat> it helps you, to, it helps us to, as I said, see different connections to other biblical texts. The third, and probably the, the level that you've heard about the most over your life, because you've heard, if you've ever been in synagogue or temple, you've heard rabbis give sermons. Sermons are usually based on what are called drash or drashot. Drash is a Hebrew word meaning to search or to seek out. Uh, and in the context of understanding Bible, understanding any classic text, drash means not only to delve into the deeper meaning of the story, but to fi find homiletical material, what you and I would call sermonic material. So there's, <clears throat> so you remember the story of Elijah, who was uh, one of the most famous prophets, lived in the middle 800s. Well, according to the book of Kings, Elijah doesn't die. He literally goes up to heaven and ascends in a fiery chariot. So if you and I had time to read some of the classic material, the, the, drash, the drashot or the, the midrash, the word you and I generally run into is midrash, that's the noun. Midrash means a interpretive story or a homiletical story. So there are literally dozens and dozens of stories explaining what happened to Elijah. Did he in fact die? What happened to his soul? Uh, <clears throat> and so forth and so on. And the, and the last level of interpretation or the deeper level, deepest perhaps, it's called sod. I just put this little diacritical mark. So my sister once said, oh, that looks like sod. No, it's sod in Hebrew. Sod means a secret, that which is of the mysterious mystical realm. And that's where the world of Jewish mysticism is focused. That's what we're talking about in the coming months. So in a nutshell, uh, while we're all enamored of modern, so to speak, Kabbalistic understandings of the Bible and understandings of text, uh, as I said, the Kabbalah didn't really em originate or flower in Europe until the 1200s, maybe the late 1100s and then blasting forth into the 13th century. So the question is, well, was there any kind of mystical thinking or mystical research discussion going on in Jewish life long before that? And the answer is, of course, yes. Because how can a civilization or how can a religious culture survive without some people asking the deeper questions? What is the mystical meaning of this? Uh, <clears throat> when Ezekiel has a, ch a glimpse of his chariot and uh, and he sees a group of strange angelic creatures ascending or descending from heaven, if you read the first chapter or two of the book of Ezekiel, you would think this is, this is a, a man who is having some kind of mental breakdown. Or some, something strange must have been going on in his brain when he wrote the opening chapters of Ezekiel. Uh, the rabbi said, no, he, he was, a, he was a, an important prophet. He didn't have a psychic breakdown. He simply is speaking in Hebrew, but really talking on a, a totally secret level or a mystical level. So what I'm trying to say, because I don't want to belabor the, ex, the examples, but I want to sort of adumbrate or outline the idea that Jewish mystical thinking evolved, it just flowered in every century. 
but it, had, it was given different names, and it wasn't systematized, really. The reason the uh, Kabbalists and this whole system called, that comes out of the book called the Zohar is so important is it took a long time till some of the great thinkers created a system of, so to speak, mystical understanding of the text. And in so doing, they created a whole new genre of literature. In fact, uh, the, the book called the Zohar is, is, is effectually referred to as the Holy Zohar, meaning those in the Middle Ages, the great teachers of the Middle Ages, thought it was as important as anything in the Bible. And they, and they encouraged all their communities in Europe once the manuscripts started to be disseminated throughout Europe, they encouraged people to study the Zohar with, with great, you know, seriousness. And then, of course, once you have a, you know, a very important book like that published, uh, you've got people writing commentaries, right? Because there have to be explanations of what's really going on in this bestseller. So we'll get to that in just a minute. So now you know these are the ways we can... Uh, so to speak, pull apart a biblical text. <clears throat> the, the other important question to ask before I explain who these famous people are and how they impacted our way of thinking about mystical ideas is, why was it in this time in history that suddenly thinkers, people, you know, you have a small slice on the society who are very well educated and apparently someone was supporting them, right? Maybe they all married well-to-do women. <laughs> it was the tradition in the Middle Ages that the best students in the yeshiva would be married off to the daughters of the richest men in the city or the community. That way, the, the brightest of students could continue studying their whole lives and continue the, the tradition of scholarship whether they were in Germany or France or in the north near Paris or in the south in Provence. So the, the question that I want to raise is what happened to the Jewish world in the early Middle Ages? And you and I know exactly, two, we know very well what happened. First of all, we were being <clears throat> run over by the Crusaders from the late 1100s through the 1200s. Uh, crusaders marching through Europe were decimating Jewish communities over and over in, in, in ter in terrible, with terrible consequences. Tens of thousands of citizens died. Uh, and one consequence of those disasters is that uh, some of the rabbis of that period began writing laments or poetry, famous dirges. Uh, which, and these poems called Piyutim appear in our High Holiday prayer book. Uh, <clears throat> because they're, they're mourning, they're eulogizing all of these Jews in France and Germany and Italy who have been slaughtered by the Crusaders. The second thing that happens, e perhaps even more profound, is the expulsion from Spain in 1492 and the expulsion from Portugal in 1497. So remember, the Inquisition started in 1391 with a man named Torquemada, who was appointed by the King of Spain to basically figure out a way to get rid of all the Jews in Spain, in the Iberian Peninsula. Um, and when 1492, it's no coincidence that Columbus sailed the ocean blue at that point. There's all kinds of theories that he was a Murano, he was a secret Jew that he needed to get out of Italy, and he was taking with him his crew, or perhaps many, many Muranos, secret Jews, what sometimes referred to as conversos, people who came from a Jewish background but had to adopt a Catholic patina or overlay in order to stay alive. So that was the most profound disaster uh, for the Jewish world from 1300s, and remember, the Inquisition was still operating in the early 1700s. We have all kinds of literature. There are wonderful professors from uh, UNM who have written a number of books on the conversos and the whole history of the Muranos and what happened 
to the secret Jews who came to America. And, yeah, and here in northern New Mexico, you know, names like Baraja and Perez, uh, even Martinez, many of these names are from Hebrew words that have, were Latinized when the families became Catholics 500 years ago. So the consequence of the, ex the exile, which began really, began in the early 1400s, but it, it reached a horrible crescendo in 1492 in the next 10 years, the consequences were, and this is what sort of impelled or propelled the uh, Jewish thinkers to dive into the world of mysticism. They wanted to know how are we going to recover from this exile? Is this exile permanent? Does God want us always to be driven out of whatever country we're in? Will we ever be able to come back to the Holy Land? Another, const another question that came up for the, think you know, the thinkers of that time was uh, if, we are, if, we are sort of, if we are looking in the long trajectory towards the messianic fulfillment, in this world, how does this exile impact that messianic hope, that messianic expectation? Will we ever get there? Will the Messiah ever come to us, or are we destined to be, so to speak, downtrodden? Um, and the I think the third way of thinking about this, the consequence of the exile is, what about the relationship between human beings and God? to tell the Jewish people that he, that she, is tired of us, that he has given up on us, that he, that he, <clears throat> that the Almighty is in fact the source of this exile, or the causes, you know, the ultimate cause, because if that's the case, then what is the hope for the future? If, if Jews were going, if Jews were to become so depressed and think that God had, so to speak, broken the covenant, broken that essential relationship between the Almighty and the Jewish people. And the consequence thereof was that we were driven out. It wasn't just that we were driven out, you know. We don't have real numbers, but probably, I remember my professor once said it, more than 100,000 Spanish Jews were killed <laughs> once the uh, expulsion began in 1492. But we have, truthfully, we have no way to know exactly. We know that Many, many people died because they were put in prison or they refused to become Catholics. And we know that the lucky ones who, had, who perhaps had enough resources uh, left and went east into Italy and then to Turkey. Uh, going to Israel wasn't much of a, a strong possibility because there, was, there wasn't much to, there wasn't much safety or economic activity in the land of Israel in the 12, 1300s. It was kind of a barren place. It was, you know, Jerusalem existed. It was actually, from what I've read, a very dangerous city and unprotected from all kinds of marauding armies and who were marching through, you know, the, from Syria across to the northern part of the, the Egyptian Sinai. So that's, that's, to me, that's an important thing to consider. Why would, at a certain time in history, suddenly we have this incredible efflorescence of mystical thinking and mystical writing going on? And I think it comes from this whole question of how do we deal with the exile? I have a question that may be very basic. Why were so many Jews in Spain and not in other countries? Well, we, there were... There were a significant uh, community in Spain. There were also significant, very large Jewish communities in France and what we call Southern Germany. Uh, it wasn't just, it wasn't as if, you know, 90% of the Jews at the time were stuck in Spain or happy to be in Spain. But, but part of the reason Spanish Jewry had, uh, had become such an important center of intellectual, cultural, and artistic development was, uh, before the, I want to say, in the 1100s and 
in the very early, no, even earlier than that. Let's say somewhere in the 1100s and a little bit before and after, there was what was called the Golden Age of Spain. Don't quote me on the time frame. But that was one of the greatest periods of intellectual development, both in literature, science. Uh, it was a time when the, the church was very tolerant of the Jewish community in Spain and encouraged Jewish intellectuals and rabbis and so forth. And even though, uh, well, we were just treated really well. It's called the Golden Age. So I think perhaps that's why there, were, there was quite a significant population. So, okay, so now we're, we're coming to Kabbalah, I promise you. Because <laughs> I don't want to, I want, Peter has many wonderful things to share with us tonight. So these are four <coughs> emanations, so to speak, of the early Kabbalistic world. Oh, I should, I should be fair. I'm always, we're always using all kinds of vocabulary and then we don't, and we don't uh, translate. So Kabbalah does not mean, you know, go to LA, put a red string around your arm, wear some fancy beads, you know, hang out, <laughs> hang out with some of the rock stars of the 80s and 90s. So Kabbalah comes from the Hebrew word to receive. To receive. It's from the verb to receive. Le kabel. It means the received tradition. So that, that word in itself has you know, five different dictionary uh, definitions. <clears throat> but it becomes a, you know, a, a noun with a capital kuf, with a capital K, in the 1200s when, uh, wasn't it Nachmanides who first referred to it? Or used the term uh, he's using. Okay, I think, but I don't. I don't want to give you too many names. There, one of uh, the great, one of the great Spanish leaders, who helped protect the Jews in Spain in the late 1200s, because they were always, we were always going through disputations with a cardinal or a bishop. And they were trying to prove that the Talmud was wrong and we didn't know what we were doing and so forth and so on. One of the great uh, defenders of the Jewish people in Spain at the time was, his name was Nachmanides. These are actually all nicknames. So Rabbi Nachman, in, he, in, uh, in the English it would be Nathan. <laughs> Rabbi Nachman, who lived as I said, I think he died around 1290 or something, towards the end of that century. He was the most renowned politician, econo economic advisor to the king, a brilliant uh, commentator on the Bible, also a mystic, was very involved in astrology and, and numerology. And he, from what I, most of the texts I've read, he, he takes this word and says, this is what we're talking about. This is the, this is the story. This is the essence. This is the source, not the source. This is the subject that I want to speak about, namely the mystical interpretation of Torah texts. Um, prior to it, so he's, as I said, he's in the late 1200s. So the most What's interesting is even the ras rationalists in the early Middle Ages, many of them were mystics. But it wasn't always such a good idea to advertise that you were thinking about mystical ideas or even to write commentaries and produce mystical interpretations of biblical texts. Because sometimes, as the leader of a community, you could get yourself in a lot of trouble depending on who was financing the community. So Moses Maimonides, you, you and I have heard much about over the years, he was probably the greatest genius of that century, of the 12th century. <clears throat> he was this, the son of a, a noted Dayan, a, a famous judge. He, he was raised as a young boy in Cordoba, 
uh, the Almohades came from Morocco. This was a Muslim sect, conquered Spain, were busy you know, trying to get rid of as many Jews as they could out of Spain. This was in the 1130s, 1140s. And so Moses Maimonides and his, his brother and his father left and went to Morocco, which was kind of strange because it wasn't such a good place to be anyway. But it was, it, some little cities in Morocco were protected. The point I want to tell you about Maimonides in two minutes is, by the time he was 20, he was already recognized as one of the great minds of the Jewish world. He wrote a commentary on the Mishnah. He wrote a short uh, essay on the 613 commandments. You know, this was somebody, like once in a, you know, once in a five generations, you know, somebody with a 200 IQ things that we can't even imagine, that, that he had such an overwhelming comprehension of every Jewish book available at that time in history as a teenager. It's hard to imagine. Plus, he was fluent in Arabic and other languages, so he was already in his 20s communicating with famous Arab philosophers who wanted to understand about the Talmud. And at that time, in, in the middle 1100s, um, there was good communication between Arab scholars and Jewish scholars. So he's considered the great rationalist. He takes everything in the Talmud and says, I'm going to systematize all the, all the laws, all the teachings, all the midrashim, all the allegories, all the homiletics, and put it down in a series of volumes so I can explain to you, you regular Jews, wherever you may live, how to live a, a proper life. How to raise your children, how to educate your children, uh, how to enter into the covenant, what are the responsibilities of, a, of an adult woman, an adult male, all the laws on everything, literally everything from, as they say, from womb to tomb. And he writes this series of books called the Mishnah Torah. And that, that if nothing else, that made him famous for the next thousand years. So it's basically a compendium of all of the laws and all of the commandments in the, in the five books of Moses and all the additional laws that we have in the Talmud. And he says, I need to do this in an organized, rational, systematic fashion because most people don't know what they're really doing. And he writes this, it's about, the copy that I have is six or seven volumes. I've forgotten. But, <clears throat> So he's considered, so to speak, a great organizing principle or organizing principalist <laughs> of that century. What we do know after you know, years of scholarship is that he was underneath, beneath the surface, he was also a mystic. But because of the conditions of the day and because he lived in Cairo, finally he and his family got to Cairo, which was a safe place for Jews at that time. Uh, and he became the head rabbi of the whole city. And he, he was an MD, so he was busy taking care of the caliph and all the harem of the caliph in that city. Uh, he didn't have time to write about or publish his mystical things. He, he would have been you know, thrown in prison. That would have been the end of his family. But we, another important sort of early hint at, at, at the Kabbalah is this book called Sefer Bahir. <clears throat> what is what is by here? Light. light. It has to do with light. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So I want to say that this book, Safer by Here, and the Zohar are written in a style what's called pseudo epigraphic. You know what that means? In other words, the person that's smart. pseudo pseudo epigraphic. The person writes the book, you know, in those days they were writing on parchment or vellum, and they're manuscripts, and they're rolled up. He writes, the, he writes the text, but he attributes and tells everybody that he's in, in community with all the other scholars, this is a book that comes from the second century. I discovered it. And in the case of, and so in other words, the author takes his own ego, his own personality out of the, out of the writing, and, and 
it enables him to delve into the world of mystical thinking without being, so to speak, a target for what do you, what do you think you know? You think you're smarter than all the other smart teachers and rabbis in Amsterdam, Antwerp, wherever, <laughs> Girona, you know, Padua, Rome, and so forth. So pseudo-epigraphic writing was, an, was it an accepted form of authorship in the Middle Ages. And it, it protected the author from all kinds of possible problems. It also, so to speak, freed the author to go into his or her own world. So I've got to do this quickly. So Sefer Bahir takes the, takes the whole world, the whole question of the tree of life and, <clears throat> and, and explains the ten Sufi wrote. I know Petter is going to explain this in great detail to us, but just in general, this Sufi wrote means uh, emanations or illuminations. You know, like what, what somebody once told me were energy sources. And what are these ten emanations? These are aspects or attributes of the divine personality that emanate through, through the world. And it's interesting that this book means light and Zohar means luminous. And the, the reason the, the titles of these famous books often have to do with light is that part of the mystical understanding of the world is that God imbued every person with a special light. And through, and not just every person, I have to say, every, everything on the earth, trees, rocks, the valley, the mountains, the, the sun, and every, everything is imbued with, a, with some kind of spiritual light. And the question is, how do we draw that light out? How do we bring that light closer towards the divine? How do we get out of our own miserable, materialistic, egocentric world and raise ourselves up to a higher level of connection with the divine? So Sefer Bahir is one of the early, uh, so to speak, explanations of mystical, Jewish mystical thinking. And it's, I'm not going to explain this. I'll let Peter talk about it. <clears throat> As I said, we don't know who really wrote it. He was, a, he was obviously a super smart guy, and he attributed it to a second century sage. He attributed the book, his book, to a, a second century rabbi. From what I understand, it's a very short little book. It's about 12,000 words. That's kind, of, that's kind of brief. But it had a huge impact. Then, a little bit later, uh, we have this famous Spanish student and teacher named Moses de Leon, who, as I said, again, in a pseudo-epigraphic way, has visions of <clears throat> that he's writing a commentary about the Bible, but it's not his writing, it's not from his mind, it's from the mind of a great sage who lived at the end of the second century named Shimon Bar Yochai, or Simeon, son of Yochai. I mean, Bjork was uh, <clears throat> one of the, the great rabbis who, who uh, I should say, he lived earlier, kind of in the, the middle of the second century. He was busy fighting against the Romans. The Romans knew how famous he was and how, that he still had a following of students in, outside of Jerusalem, because you know, the Romans had come in and basically wiped out Jerusalem by the year. 120 or so in the second century. But he was so famous and so, wor so worried the Romans that uh, they went after him. So he hid in the cave for what, 12 years, 10 years, I forgot, I think 12 years. He hid in the cave for 12 years and produced all kinds of great teachings um, and then came forward and wrote down some of his mystical insights. So Moses de Leon writes the Zohar and, and basically says, this book comes from Rabbi Simeon, son of Yochai, the, great, the greatest sage of the second century. It's another way for him to protect himself and also to go off into all kinds of uh, 
paroxysms of literary beauty. I mean, his writing is amazing, but it doesn't, it's not so easy to understand. By the way, he writes, he doesn't write in Hebrew, he writes in Aramaic. And the way scholars figured out, or kind of, so to speak, proved that he was really the author is that his Aramaic doesn't always sound like the kind of Aramaic that was being written in the second, first century, you know, first, second centuries. Aramaic, you know, was the standard language for everybody back then. He has his own style. But this becomes the, this becomes the core of the, of the Kabbalah, the early Kabbalah. And everybody who reads Moses de Leon's manuscripts starts writing their commentaries. So there are two or three very famous commentaries written in the next 20 years on this, and they become part of the corpus of material called the Zohar. So, to, so I have to say in simple language, what's he writing about? He's looking at stories in Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the book of Job, the book of Ecclesiastes, and he's writing his own commentary of what, it, what is the mystical meaning of all these stories. In other words, he's not writing a novel, you know, de novo, <laughs> off the top of his head. He's taking famous biblical stories and giving them a completely new and incredibly insightful interpretation that basically nobody had ever thought about. So he's a genius. Lots of people threw rocks at him, but he was definitely a genius. <laughs> but he had, as I said, he had to protect himself. And lastly, uh, when we talk about Kabbalah, and Heder will explain this much more clearly, the Kabbalah of the late 1500s was was happening in Safat, in northern Israel. Safat was a great, apparently was a great mercantile center in Israel. People were coming from Syria and, and Turkey and crossing, you know, crossing over the mountains and entering into the, coming into the Safat and then going down through the Galilee past Jerusalem towards Egypt. It was, it was a major economic center. It was a good place to live, and if you were a scholar, there were lots of rich merchants who would support scholars. So Spanish rabbis who had managed to survive the Inquisition and get far away from Spain uh, came together in various groups, kind of like chavaraz, uh, like study groups, and coalesced in 1560s, 70s, 80s in Safat and began creating this new or they took, they so to speak, took all of this new material and produced what you and I call, for lack of a better term, the modern Kabbalah. <laughs> the modern Kabbalah of the late 1500s. And that's what got everybody so excited back in the 1990s. Suddenly people started to read this literature and thought, well, first of all, it was very hard to read because there weren't any good English translations. But thanks to one or two fantastic... Uh, uh, teachers and translators in America, we have m very excellent modern translations. So, Cordovero, I just want to mention this man. Cordovero was a teacher for Isaac Luria. And Luria is credited with being the, uh, so to speak, the genius behind this whole Spanish Kabbalistic system. Except he didn't write any books. Better will explain. He was a great teacher and sermonizer. He had acolytes. He had fellow sages around him. He wrote down everything he said. So if he gave a sermon for two or three hours on Shabbat, which was probably normal practice, these, these people were professional memorizers. And they could recount, recall every single thing that Rabbi Luria spoke about. And then as soon as the Sabbath was over at 7.30 at night, they, they start writing as fast as they could, transcribing their notes, you know, their mental notes from what was spoken. So Cordo, Cord, Cordovero, another very important Spanish <coughs> teacher from, and here's what I want to say. What Cordovero did was explain to people that 
<clears throat> mysticism is available to everyone. You don't have to be a PhD from you know, this university. You don't have to be a scholar in, in, in the Torah. <clears throat> Every, the purpose of understanding the Zohar and mystical writings is to chart a moral code for each and every person. It's a way of an individual's uh, avenue towards coming closer to God. Because before that, many of the Kabbalists or many of these intellectuals were saying the Kabbalah and all these very esoteric ways of understanding Bible, it's really only, it, it should only be for those who are highly educated, postdocs. Because the average guy can't do it. The average woman can't do it. But well, that's one of the important aspects of, of Cordovero's writing. And again, he was terribly concerned with the expulsion from Spain. He wanted to ex explain to his people, to his followers, how to live in the world of the exile. And he also wanted to explain the exile of the Shekhinah, which I'll let Heder talk about whenever he gets to that point. The Shekhinah is one of the, uh, the ten Sufi wrote. So, wow, I'm sorry I talked to you. Okay. First of all, thank you all for coming. And thank you, Rabbi, for very nice introduction to Kabbalistic work and to survey of Kabbalist during a couple of hundred years. As you may remember from last year, at least some of you, what is the purpose of Kabbalah? It provides opportunity and way how to come closer to God. Of course, come closer to God doesn't mean climb up towards the cloud of above the clouds. In spiritual world, the distance is not measured in distance in physical separation. Separation or distance from God means how different we are from God. We know from Torah that God is merciful, he is wise, he is kind, etc. And this, we have to imbibe these characteristics into ourselves. And more we do that, closer we come to God. And closer we are, more we are able to listen to God. Rabbi mentioned light, right? And in Torah, you read during the first day, God said, let there be light. He does not mean, he does not mean flow of photons like we have today light. Light really means God's vital energy. Flow of this energy towards the whole universe. And this gives existence to the whole universe. And that light is coming continuously, continuously even to us. But mostly we are unaware of this light. But it, we see its consequence, that we exist, that we can sing, we can sing the songs, we can be joyous. That's all a result of God's light coming to us. However, we are like covered by several veils or shells of our selfishness, of our interests, of our worries, of our cares for ourselves, our family, etc. And because of those, we cannot receive the light from God in such a way that we can understand him. And Kabbalah provides way how to get this understanding. Now, 
in general, you know, there are differences between, uh, you know, let us say, orthodox rabbis and Kabbalists. You may know if you talk about, about uh, resurrection. Orthodox rabbis all believe in the resurrection that Messiah will come, body will be resurrected from the grave, and they will live happily ever after forever. Kabbalists, of course, have freedom. If you wish, you can believe that. If you don't believe that, it's okay. You are still Jewish Kabbalists. Similarly, about Torah. We read that Torah was given to Moses at Mount Sinai. If you talk to Orthodox rabbi and ask who wrote Torah, everybody tells you Moses, everything, word by word. Each word is word by God. If you ask Kabbalists, some believe that, because some Kabbalists are Orthodox rabbis. Some don't believe that. They say, yes, Torah was written by people who were inspired by God. It was written at various times, at various places. And both are Kabbalists, and both are, of course, Jews, According to my statement, of course, Orthodox rabbi would have a different opinion on those who don't believe that Torah was given by God and that their resurrection they may not be or may be, etc. And I have studied you know, Zohar, of course, Talmud and Torah, plus writing of most of famous Kabbalists, including Maimonides. I have to say that like 15 years ago, when I first time started to study Torah and Judaism, first book I really read is Maimonides, Guide to the confused, to perplex. Guide to the perplex. Even before I started to read Torah. So my opinion probably is colored somehow by Maimonides, really. Concerning, you know, this Kabbalist, I would say, I will cover a little bit wider range. I will start about year 100 of current era with Rabbi uh, Yohanan ben Zakkai. His student was Rabbi Elizir. His student was Rabbi Akiva. And his student was Shimon ben Bar Yochai, who according to a tradition, wrote Zohar in the year about 150. So let me, let me start telling you story really in the middle of that story, where I will tell you story from Talmud about Rabbi Elazir. Rabbi Elazir was very highly recognized rabbi on, of the time about 110, 120, 130, during that time. And one of his fellow rabbi, and Elazir was member of Sanhedrin, which is basically, congram, you know, composed of about 70 rabbis, and they decide basically all questions 
Jews may have concerning Jewish law, concerning halakha especially. And uh, chairman of Sanhedrin at this ta that time was Rabbi Gamliel II. Gamliel was grandson of Rabbi Hillel. Maybe you have heard story about Hillel. So he was grandson of Hillel and he was president or chairman of Sanhedrin. And Rabbi Elazir was member of Sanhedrin. And they had the discussion among rabbis about, about the stove. When stove get contaminated, get impure, how to clean it, how to make the stove again pure. And Rabbi Elazir, he said, if stove, stove is taken apart, and each part is carefully cleaned, then immersed in water, and then stove is put together after that, he said, stove is clean, cloth stove is pure. But all rabbi on Sanhedrin disagreed with him. They said, no, stove is remain impure. So they had discussion, and Rabbi Elazir said, if I am right, let, let the heaven replace this tree, replanted about 50 feet away, and tree got replanted 50 feet away. And Rabbi said, tree does not decide halakha. Tree does not decide the law. So Rabbi Elizir said, if my interpretation correct, let this river testify to them. And river started to flow upstream. And Rabbi said, the river does not decide halakha, does not decide the law. So Rabbi Elazir said, if my interpretation correct, let divine voice confirm it. And everybody heard voice from heaven. It is correct, as Rabbi Elazir says. And Rabbi said, heaven does not decide halakha. Torah was given to us, to rabbis. It is now on the earth. It is not in heaven. So we decide halakha. And Rabbi Elazir still did not agree with that. So what happened? Rabbi Gamliel excommunicated him from Jewish community. <laughs> At that time, to be excommunicated, it is kind of end of public life for the person. There was nothing else. There was not another synagogue around the corner. He could not go to another one. And there was no other religion. So he basically spent the rest of his life alone in the house just with his wife. And by the way, wife of, of Rabbi Elazir was a sister of Rabbi Gamliel. So that's one story in Talmud. And uh, what is the lesson here? For Rabbi, the lesson is that we have the power now to decide Jewish law. We have the power now to decide how Jews will live their life. And voice of heaven does not count anymore. Okay, that's Rabbi concluded, and basically many of those, even till today, believe that it is true. That basically, like vote of rabbis, not the democratic vote of everybody, just of selected group of rabbis, decide what is the halakha, what is the Jewish law, and how it should be interpreted. According to me, this is 
considerable disaster for Jewish people because now God is out and what count is our decision. We rabbi we will decide what is true, what is not true. God now has nothing to do with that. So I believe this is, according to my interpretation, major disaster for Jewish religion and for Jewish people. Now, <clears throat> uh, Rabbi Elazir, who was excommunicated, you know, this has story, continued story, I don't want to tell too much today, I leave it for next time maybe, what happened between Gamliel and Rabbi Elazir, but uh, <clears throat> now, After Rabbi Elazir, one of his students was Rabbi Akiva, very famous from Torah and from Zohar, Rabbi Akiva. And student of Rabbi Akiva was Shimon Bar Yochai, according to the tradition, author of Zohar. And Zohar, according to me, represent rebellion against, against rabbinic establishment of his time. And uh, I believe it is not accident that Zohar was put, you know, to, as an author given to Shimon Bar Yochai, because Shimon Bar Yochai was a student of Akiva and grand student of Rabbi Elazir, who was excommunicated. And what happened to many Kabbalists, it is a repeated story. Most of Kabbalists were always persecuted by established rab rabbinic power. There is Abulaf, Rabbi Abraham Abulafia, which was just after Maimonides. He was hunted over all world by, by students of Nachmanides. And he was completely destroyed. The rabbi, famous rabbi, uh, A famous rabbi in Spain, they wrote a letter to all students of Abraham Abulafia telling them, don't study with this guy, he's a heretic, he's teaching not Jewish law, he's teaching something else. He was Abulafia, he was teaching various meditations, how to get your consciousness off yourself to higher state of consciousness and how to come closer to God. It was, of course, something which Rabbi, of course, felt that something which does not support our authority, which compete with our authority, and because of that, everybody was after him. Similarly, happened with Maimonides, right? Maimonides, today people say, even Jews say, you know, there was no Moses until Moses. From Moses to Moses, they mean from Moses who got Torah up to Moses Maimonides. But at the same time, they reject completely, I would say 90% of teaching of Maimonides. They, they, you know, rabbis accept Moses teaching that God has no body. He has no legs, no arms, no face. So they accept that God is not like we are, really. And second, what they accept very much is 13, 13 statements of Maimonides, you know, what 
describe what each Jew sh should believe. But Maimonides wrote these 13 attributes or 13 whatever when he was a young guy, when he was 20 years old. And in his, in his Guide to Perplex, which is one of the last of his writing, he never mentioned these 13 attributes. He completely ignores it at late, when he was arrived at later stage. But I will talk about Maimonides later. So I just wanted to demonstrate that really most of Kabbalists were really rebels against established rabbinic teaching. And it started with Rabbi Elazir around the year 100 and still continue after 1500 up to, I would say, 18th century, 1750, etc., where there was Baal Shem Tov. He was founder of Hasidic movement. He lived in Poland and Ukraine in that area. And uh, Cordovero started, you know, you know that Kabbalah was for many centuries kept secret from general population. Only people highly educated, highly trained, got access to Kabbalah. It was not written, it was transmitted orally, just very few people. So it was really exclusive club of people who studied Kabbalah. It was only Cordovero around 1500 in Safed when he got idea that mess not only that Messiah will not come, but Messianic age will not come unless majority of people will change themselves according to Kabbalah. So Cordovero wrote several volumes <coughs> of uh, highly Kabbalistic works. He called it Pardes Rimuni, which means Orchard of Pomegranates. But he also wrote a little book, it's a very simple book, which is called, in Hebrew, if you translate it in English, it means pleasant light. And in this pleasant light, he gave basic, basic explanation of Kabbalistic thought in a simple language, which was accessible basically to ordinary Jew and eventually ordinary people outside Jewish community. You may know that Christians had quite a strong interest in Kabbalah, and there is also what is called Christian Kabbalah, Christian interpretation of Kabbalistic teaching. Now, I realize that many of you are here today, but not all will be here next week and following week. So there are some people who attend just first lecture, and in same way, same way, there are just people who just watch on YouTube just first tape and don't watch the remaining. Only half people, less than half, follows, you know, through after one. So I thought that I should make it clear what Kabbalah is, that uh, even those who will watch just first day or attend just the first lecture will have some, in, some clear picture what Kabbalah is and what Kabbalah is not. So now I have to erase this a little bit because I will have to write on, black, on blackboard. Okay. From... Uh, 
many sources from study of many books, I somehow deduce for myself 10 basic principles which I believe constitute what is Kabbalah. So I call it 10 basic principles. And principle number one is basically first commandment from Ten Commandments. I put it like, I will write just I am here. I am Yud have Vav He, your Elohim, and you will have no other Elims, you will have no other gods beside me. It means you will have no gods next to me or no gods instead of me. I am Yud Hevav He and I am your Elohim, I am your God and you will have no other gods except me. There's a first commandment from Ten Commandments and I believe it is first principle on Kabbalah. All Kabbalists believe in existence on divine, intelligent divine, which is responsible for creation and is responsible for our life, giving our life each second. So I put it just very short way, I am, which means I am, you'd have Abuhe, etc. Second basic principle is Kabbalistic words. Kabbalistic words. Kabbalah tells us that this physical world is not the only world which exists. There is physical world which we live in and there are spiritual worlds. Spiritual worlds cannot be detected by our physical senses. But Kabbalah has system of worlds. Universe is quite a complicated structure because worlds interact with each other and affect each other. So second basic assumption of Kabbalah is there are spiritual worlds, and this physical world is not the only world which exists. Third basic principle is angels. Angels. We are people living in 21st centuries, right? Most of us don't believe in this tiny creature with wings which flies, etc. I also don't believe in angels like that. But angels in Kabbalah, they are just concentration of spiritual energy. They are like blobs of concentrated spiritual energy energy. That's what is called angels. Not any, any, these funny creatures, just condensed energy. And what Kabbalah tells us, that each your good thoughts, each of your good speech, if each of your good actions creates an angel in spiritual world. So Kabbalah teaches us that we are not useless, we are not just living here. Our thoughts, speech and action affect higher spiritual world. And what is important, these angels 
affect back to us. They affect back us. And they influence our feelings, they influence our thoughts. Very often you may think, oh, now I got bright thought. There is probably an angel who is just sending, sending you blessing and induces you with that thought. You get idea, I will do something great, I will make donation to this organization. You get just basic idea. And that angels encourage you, they tell you, do it. It's time not to think about it, only do it. And similarly, other things. But unfortunately, also your bad thoughts, your bad speech, and your bad actions create also angel in higher worlds, but not a good angel create what Kabbalah called dark angels. And this dark angel similarly affect us back. If you get idea, I don't have enough money, I go to rob the bank. This dark angel tells you, that's a good idea, let us do it, let us go. So they encourage you to do bad deeds. There are people, let us say, who watch pornography. Each person who watches pornography creates corresponding angel. And so angels affect people not only here, all over the world. When somebody then goes to rape somebody, all those people who had thoughts of pornography, etc., who spend time with that, they are responsible for those rapes which happen on the opposite side of the earth. Because each thought like that, each imagination, each picture will you firm in your mind create corresponding angel. And that angel, if he finds that somebody else had a thought, he encouraged that person to amplify that thought. So, we are responsible for everything that is happening on the earth. Where there is a war, our violent thoughts, our anger create those angels who then induce people to go into the war kill other people, etc. So because of that, Cordovero noticed there will be no peace on the earth until all people, not only selective small group of Kabbalists, until all people change their characteristics, change their character, become kind, respectable, respected life, opinion of each other. Cordovero started it, but then uh, other people, Baal Shem Tov was next one, right? Baal Shem Tov for many years studied himself. He practiced ascetism. He was fasting from Shabbat to Shabbat. Okay, seven days he was fasting so that he can get close to God and understand God, what God wants. But when he got it, then he said, Kabbalah and this enlightenment is for everyone. And he started Hasidic movement. But Hasidic movement again did not survive for too long in the form Baal Shem Tov wanted. Barshem was, was teaching, and his student, Nachman of Bratslav, both were teaching that each person can change himself until he becomes a righteous person, until he becomes tzaddik. But after then came again Lubachovich, 
rabbis who changed it and said, no, you cannot become tzaddik. Tzaddik is born, given a special privilege by God, and only he can be tzaddik. Other people cannot reach level of tzaddik. And they started to teach, don't even try. You were not made for that. What is for you good is to do mitzvah and listen to your rabbi. Now, I have to say what I partially repeat what I said a year ago, that Kabbalah has three basic basic discipline. First one is theoretical study, which is just speculative study about universe and about human soul, etc. It is called also theoretical Kabbalah. Theoretical Kabbalah. That is the first thing which is useful because we do better think which we understand why we are doing different things. And that's the task of theoretical Kabbalah, to explain us what needs to be done, how it is done, etc. Second part of Kabbalah is what I call meditation. It is called, in some writing, it is called experimental Kabbalah. Experimental because you have tried many different things to find out what works for you. There is no one meditation which would work for everybody. Everybody is a little bit different and he needs to try many things to do experiment until he finds what suits him the best and what provides him with fastest progress. And the third part of Kabbalah is what I call changing your character. This is called also practical Kabbalah. Practical Kabbalah. And <clears throat> I spent all my time, which was almost half an hour, on so-called talking about theoretical Kabbalah, how things may work, etc. I am here, number three. I have, let me at least write number four. Number four I will call, call Ruach HaKodesh. Ruach HaKodesh. Ruach means spirit. HaKodesh means holy. But in English is really translated yeah, like divine inspiration. Divine inspiration is lower, lower level of prophecy. Divine inspiration is intuition. You get suddenly thoughts and something suddenly become clear, what was unclear for a long time. You can have dreams, for example, with inspiring dreams, which can be part of Ruhag HaKodesh. <coughs> Like, you know, Rabbi el -Azir in the story which I told you, right? He get, said, let voice from heaven confirm that my interpretation is correct. And voice confirm it. So that's Ruach HaKodesh. This is not like prophets prophesy what will happen in the future, but it is understanding of some topic. 
By the way, I said that it was about oven, how to clean oven, right? You remember? Which got I impure. But in reality, this impurity means individual human being. Instead of individual human being, they talk about oven. They, of course, mean human beings who is a sinner, right? Who did many horrible things. Now, if he is put apart, if he does the shuva, then when he is clean, he promises not to do it anymore, and he do even some other things so that he is clean. And Rabbi said, no, he is not yet clean, and this guy said, yes, he is clean, regardless of his earlier sins. So, Ruach HaKodesh and a rabbi also say, many rabbis today, orthodox rabbis say, forget Ruach HaKodesh. This is your hallucination. Don't pay any attention to that. Do you do just your mitzvah and you have a problem, ask your rabbi. But it was Maimonides in 1200 who basically, again, rebel against this rabbinic interpretation and said, no, each man is capable to develop Ruach HaKodesh. Each person is able to increase his intuition and his basically hearing, understanding the light of God who is coming to him, to everybody each second. Ruach HaKodesh was like force, number, and number five, let us say, let me put here, reincarnation. Okay, these are five, I said there are ten basic things, but there are five basic things which explain the world, the creation, about the universe, how it works. And I have another five which basically concern what we have to do. But these other five I will leave for next week. I will not go there today because it's already a few minutes after 8 o'clock. So I don't want to uh, hold you for too long here. Okay, I usually start and finish this Kabbalistic invocation. I, I, today I did not do at the beginning, but I will do at the end. And I also plan to do some meditation today, but again I have to postpone it for next week. Okay, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together, to draw together, to form a vessel to catch the dew of heaven. If it be thy will, may the veil of heaven be drawn back, and may your Ruach HaKodesh descend upon us, that we may know your presence. Lord, from thee comes all alive. Lord, from thee comes all love. Lord, from thee comes all grace. So be it. Ah, thank you for coming, okay?